right, introduce then, yeah. Uh, yeah, welcome everybody uh, to another uh, New Way Growth Connex uh, portal LinkedIn Live, uh, and we have the lovely Andrew Wilson here. Uh, most of you are going to know what we're talking about here, but I'm going to uh, uh, get Sam to do more of an intro and, uh, and detail into the session. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Um, doesn't really need much of an introduction, to be honest. As I say, anyone that I've, I'm connected to, anyone Adam's connected to, is probably connected to Andrew as well. If you're not, you should be. Um, <laughs> So these sessions, obviously we run these sessions once a month, different theme every month, different topic. Um, and this month we're going to be talking around the government strategy and ideas and calls for ministers and campaigns and manufacturing champions. So I think we'll, we'll kick off with a, just a quick introduction, Andrea, away from the campaign in terms of yourself and what you're doing, and then we'll jump into any questions. Um, I've got a whole load of questions but obviously anyone listening live that wants to ask any questions please do so and uh, we will make sure Andrea is available to uh, to answer them so where do I, feel like I feel like I've got my own little cheerleading squad here mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> my, my team are really good at doing it but now I've got my online cheering squad so yeah <laughs> Um, I'm a director of Hone All Precision. We are a specialist machining business based in Leighton Buzzard and definitely the S of the SME bracket. There's 40 of us. Um, I'm celebrating my 30th anniversary with Hone All next month. Um, and yeah, it's been an interesting journey, you know, going from sort of four of us in a thousand square foot unit in Luton to 40 of us in a lovely 20,000 bright and modern manufacturing facility in Leighton Buzzard. Um, <clears throat> I think the main thing that sort of links to this LinkedIn Live session is the fact that for 25 of those 30 years minimum, I've got myself involved in a variety of manufacturing panels, advisory boards, um, mainly to be fair, initially, it was because they were a really good access point to learn about what grant funding was available, what support was available, linked me to things like you know, manufacturing advisory service in the early days, you know, all hail them and please come back. Um, and, you know, as a result of those positions, I then got invited onto various boards, Automotive Academy, uh, National Academy, National Skills Academy for Manufacturing, um, SFA, Skills Funding Agency, I have to remember all the acronyms. And in all honesty, 25 years later, I'm still having the same conversations with the same people about the same issues. And that's the reason for why I keep campaigning. Um, Jeff Nelder at Cranfield told me a long time ago, you'll give up. You know, you'll, you'll, they'll beat you. Um, and I said, keep saying the forehead is bruised, but it's not broken. So the, the head and the brick wall, it keeps happening. But you can't give up. And at the end of the day, if you don't, fight to change something then you certainly can't complain about it so before we go into too much detail around the campaign and and the the, the journey that you've been on why why did you start how did you start and why did you start was it something that happened within the home or business that made you realize did there needed to be more support or was it just external or was it think, all these things or what i think it was a combination of factors to be honest um there's been over the years there's been a whole host of schemes that come out um and when you actually i i'm one because i was very fortunate you know my other director basically is a very good engineer so i've always been able to sort of stay on more the administrative side of the business as much as you know i can do still do some hand honing and a bit of facing and turning because um, I've had to at various points. <clears throat> it's it's allowed me to focus on the administrative side. So I've always looked for funding. I've always looked for support. Um, I'm a big believer in getting fresh sets of eyes into the business, getting that fresh perspective. Because I know when I joined Honal, I brought such a different feel to the place just by being female um, and having a sales background as, as limited as it was. Um, and I think I've always remembered that and so tried to get other people in. But there was a particular grant I applied for. It took me probably three or four days to actually get the application together. And then when it was submitted, they immediately told me I didn't qualify anyway because I was out of a certain boundary in the area. But the person who told me to apply for the grant didn't know that. So that's one example. Sitting on Make UK board meetings as they were then, EEF, and listening to Vince Cable at the time, 
and the people around the table saying, yes, I'm from so-and-so and we have four factories in seven different countries employing 14,000 people and this is what I need and my supply chain needs this. Well, when was the last time you were in the SME supply business that you're talking about? When were you last on that shop floor within that SME? How can you say what that SME needs unless there's an SME around the table? Um, so it, it was a whole host of sort of scenarios like that. And at an EEF conference about, it was 2014, I think, um, maybe 2013, Vince Cable was there. Um, and I actually raised the question, do you not think we need a dedicated minister for manufacturing? <clears throat> Excuse me. And he went, no, I think we're doing a good enough job as we are, don't you? And he just sort of ignored me and moved on. I went, no, I don't think you are. That's why I'm asking the question. Um, and I, I, it's just, I think our government system overall frustrates me because if we run our businesses like it by employing people who know nothing about what they're actually supposed to be doing, we'd all be bankrupt. But yet we think that's acceptable to do in our government. So we put somebody in charge of schools who's never actually been a teacher or never been a headmaster or, or you know, or a, even a bursar or, you know, accountant for a school. We put people in charge of the health service that have never sort of, you know, had any experience working their way up through. So I think the government system as a whole is broken on that sense. We should be employing people who have the right skills. And it's good to see Labour bringing in um, Mr. Timpson, who is doing the prison thing, because he's had such experience bringing ex-convicts through and giving them meaningful jobs and then building new lives. We need the same for engineering and manufacturing because the majority of politicians have never visited a shop floor. They don't understand running a small business or an engineering and manufacturing business for sure. Um, but we need somebody in there who does, who can actually say, yeah, that works, but that doesn't. But actually, if you think about doing X, think how that can impact industry Y you do it together, look at, we'll, we'll double the impact. So we need that strategic collaborative approach and somebody who understands how the industries connect. Completely agree. Initially, when when you started this, when did you start this kind of campaign and this push? Uh, officially in this format, basically, was in the first two, three months of COVID when it started, because we all had a little bit of extra time because <laughs> Boris gave us a bit of confusion about whether we should be opening or not. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of my customers closed. Um, we didn't because we were still manufacturing critical components. So we worked throughout. Um, but yeah, I, it, it basically started then. It started under the banner of Support UK Manufacturing, which there is still the website up and running. But unfortunately, a lot of the people who joined at that point we all got together. We had a good few teams meetings. When business bounced back and they got busy, unfortunately, they had to focus on their businesses, which I, I totally understand. Um, and I, I and I did too. It's just that I moved doing the campaign into my personal time rather than my work time. And I, th I think that kind of sums up half the battle anyway. Orig originally, in some of the interviews and discussions that I've seen you do, there was a lot of conversation around it's not about the amount of funding, it's the funding put into the right places. And, yeah. and I think, especially as SMEs and business owners and how busy and how little resource you have for searching for some of this funding and looking around, I think if the campaign, the minister, whatever it ends up being, was to kind of filter through some of that and actually point the funding in the right direction, then that's one of the intended outcomes. Absolutely. It, we need a full review of the funding system. We have basically capital equipment. Labour's biggest drive at the minute is improving or increasing productivity in the UK. And effectively, we have capital grants available that in order to qualify, you have to recruit two extra people or three extra people. Now, I'm buying a machine in order to reduce or not reduce headcount, but minimise headcount and automate things, which again, advanced manufacturing, we've been told. We need to increase our productivity through automation. The capital grants available tell us we have to recruit people now. If you're a 150, 200 person company, you can apply for that capital grant. You can recruit those two or three people because you could recruit them into sales. You could recruit them into HR, into health and safety. They don't need to be production and you'll still get your grant. 
but me at 40 employees i can't afford to recruit two extra people without them actually producing something and i'm buying the machine in order to not have to do that so it doesn't make sense we need a a, a full shake up and review and we also need to remove all the costs that have been put into these grant and support systems by the people delivering them or selling them to the industry because it's even going back oh i got asked to speak at the house of Commons, and they talked about skills funding and i said it's a chocolate orange and they went what do you mean i went you tap it you unwrap it everybody's taking their slice and i'm left with this shiny bit of paper of the certificate at the end we need to stop those slices being taken by people who are simply making money out of the scheme not delivering the results that the business actually needs yeah as you, yeah, as you say, complete funding shake up. The money's the money's potentially there. It's just there's tons of it, and there's but, tons of it unclaimed. Rishi Sunak said at one point, "Why would I increase funding? Because there's no take up." Well, there's no take up because people a don't know where it is or what it is. They don't know if they if they can apply for it. If they can apply for it, they don't know how to, or they don't have the time to. And then when you do get through it, you realise that you've got to employ two or three people anyway in order to get 20 grand towards your machine. And those three people you're employing are going to cost you 100. What's the point? That is, for me, it's that, uh, again, coming back from that government point of view and that taxation point of view is that in driving from a productivity basis in creating automation, we are keeping things as they are, but making more. But the government and that side lose out on the taxation because they're not employing people. So the alignment strategically isn't there. So the, the, there's a there's a, a process that needs to be have around how do we actually get to both? Yeah. What do we need to do? Revamp. That's a that's a that's a, a different side. Thing. The thing. The, one of the questions for me because I read this earlier because I, I picked up on in your early conversation was the was it more the skills side now the now the reason i say this is because you've sat on a lot of the skills board and i know how how you back that skills side as well was that the first port of call with it or was it the the funding or was it like a dual side i think it it, it was everything it was simply the fact that i kept seeing people tell me what an sme needed and i kept disagreeing whether it yeah. was skills whether it was funding whether it was business strategy, even some of the guys that came in from Manufacturing Advisory Service, when Cranfield had the original contract, it worked very well because they listened to the companies. When it went to a consultancy firm, it then became a prescribed requirement of activities they were going to fulfill. So you will have this, you will have that. That is what your funding will pay for. Well, I don't need that. I have that. Yes, it's not in your format, but I have that. What I need is you to help me implement lean manufacturing or, you know, guys, and whatever your requirement is at the time. And I, and I think it's just that. And, and I see it time and time again with people feeding into government. They keep speaking on behalf of businesses that are one to 49 employees. But even though they're the government said, well, it's still an SME. They're at 200 employees or 250. The needs are so very different. And yet the majority of businesses in the engineering and manufacturing sector are under 50 employees. And yet we've got people who are three, four times the size, and in some cases, 2,000 times the size, telling the government what we need. That's yeah. the problem. Do you think that Minister of Manufacturing needs to come from that size of business? Because I've seen some posts out there that have said, oh, let's try, you know, who do we have? Do we have Jim Brailsford? Do we have, uh, you know, Bro Dyson? And, like that. and I sit there and they said, no, absolutely not. They've took out every, all the wealth and everything away from the UK. Why on earth would we, we push them forward? Personally, this is just me personally. Why on earth would I have those? And the fact that they are multi-billion turnover sort of like businesses yeah. that's not the voice of the sme what we've already got at the minute yeah it needs um, to be someone either who has has owned run or worked within the sme supply I mean, chain yeah, for me okay. you know the government have enough people our oems are amazing <clears throat> and they have fantastic government representation they have fantastic lobbying abilities 
<coughs> sorry, excuse me. It's been a long week. Been covering a lot. Um, that they, they have so so much representation in government, and they do a great job. And without them, we're all in trouble. So I am not saying the government should not continue to support our larger manufacturing businesses, but they already have a voice. We don't. Yeah. And unfortunately, when you see people talk about small business representation, it tends to be small businesses generally. And I'm, again, no disrespect to our high street shops or, you know, to the to the small sort of what I'd call more cottage industries. But engineering and manufacturing is a very different animal to your high street shop or your local pub, you know. I, I know that is one thing there because that was the reason why I asked around the skills thing. I read an article somewhere and I can't I can't remember the stats on it, but it was something like that with the the new generation, the younger generation coming through, the skills that are needed to actually manufacture stuff are being lost and there's no interest in it. And we are gonna lose them at a far quicker rate than what was originally thought uh, thought out. I was trying to look for the article article again. So if we don't address it soon, a lot of these basic fundamental skills will be gone uh, and that was across the board uh, globally across the board that discussion yesterday at the aerospace museum in, in bristol because all of that is you know traditional engineering there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there and we were having that exact discussion that this is it's already lost some of it you, know, you, mm. you can you can talk to um graduates on the shop floor and they just they don't know why they're doing certain things they're doing because that skill that training that expertise that that was there is there's no one there to teach it and they don't know why they're doing certain things they're doing so they've lost that kind of theory behind everything and yeah i can see that being even even the the the, the, the very few youngsters we have that are, are wanting to be an engineer i've got a lady i'm ringing later today <clears throat> and i i stumbled across her in a town chat you know a facebook chat Dunstable conversation um, on Facebook, who was looking for a T-level placement for a son. And the comments that came back was like, no point, nothing here, don't do that. EasyJet was really the only one mentioned. So I've, I've said I'll ring her, um, basically, when she's finished work after three today. But the government sort of tried to give us this nod to engineering and manufacturing, given as a T-level. But who in their right mind, who did they listen to that told them a T level in engineering requires less in company training than a care T level. So who, who told them that? Where did they get that idea from? Because you don't learn engineering from a, from a school book. You learn engineering from feeling, from hearing, from sounding, you know, that tip cutting that metal. Yes, design engineering, again, it's not a school book, it's a computer. And, and, and seeing people designing it, it's going to be in company. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and it just absolutely astounds me that even the things that they've tried to give us, it seems like I, I really don't know who they've listened to in order to do it. And no matter what, even if Labour come out with some amazing thing now, anything that involves further education, higher education, etc., is going to take 10 years to have any impact whatsoever. We need something now. The mm -hmm. biggest blockage to growth and increasing productivity in engineering and manufacturing is the lack of skills, lack of labor. If we had a training and development tax credit, something like an R&D tax credit, where basically we could employ a totally unskilled apprentice, bring them into our factories, they will be trained by people who have done apprenticeships in the old days. They will be trained by people who are running those machines, who are seeing that material, who are understanding those jobs, who are doing those jobs on a daily basis. They will be in a work environment so they understand you have to be on time you must have respect and you must be you know polite to your fellow workers um they will learn all those skills that are necessary and and, and it could be so simple that you know transferable skills are paid at a higher level of tax credit against corporation tax non-transferable skills in a specialist business like mine where deep hole drilling deep hole boring you know there's nobody locally who does it i can claim a tiny part but I can claim some of the some of the wages, some of the materials, some of the tooling. The college tutor, a bit like the old NVQ days, can come in and sign off the paperwork side to say, yeah, show me you've learned this this week. Show me you've learned that. You know, they could go through every department in the company. They could do sales, marketing, HR, health and safety, machining. 
and then find what their niche is. You know, the majority of the ladies I have in here who do very, very varied jobs now, but they all joined as an admin accounts person. But then they've basically seen something or dipped their toe into another area and gone, I really enjoy that. Can I learn that? Can I be trained on that? Can I do a course? And that's what we could do if we had a training and development tax credit. So going back to your more of the day day job, you've already said that skills and labour is one of the biggest challenges that, that you're facing within the business. Is there anything else at the minute that's jumping out as a big challenge that you're facing? I think the lack of stability we've had the last couple of years has certainly impacted confidence in investment in equipment. Um, it's I've seen order drag certainly this last six months because of what was happening with the previous government, the change over to Labour. Um, quite a few of my customers are saying the same thing. People are saying the orders are coming, the orders are coming, but they've not been coming. Funnily enough, we have seen a bit of a change in that the last 10 days. Um, it seems like everybody's come back off holiday and gone, oh my God, I forgot to do that or didn't get a chance to order that. Um, <clears throat> but I do think that lack of confidence, um, the lack of, of, of security in terms of what Labour are going to say in the autumn statement is preventing investment, it's holding things back. Um, if we had this long-term cross-party industrial strategy where taxation was actually guaranteed for X number of years, you know, that I think would be a major catalyst for, for, for the industry big time because, you know, the other thing in engineering and manufacturing compared to, let's just say, coffee shop in our town, if they buy a coffee machine, it's probably two grand. They'll, you know, pay it off over that year. In engineering and manufacturing, our equipment is hundreds of thousands, if not, in some cases, millions. We need that investment cycle, that assurity that investment policy and tax policy is not going to change in six months, 12 months, because we want to be planning those investments over that three, five, ten year period. So again, we just need, we've got to stop this short termism and this one size fits all within government. So based on some of those challenges and issues, how, what, essentially what's the intended outcome? What would, what would a minister, a manufacturing champion, a regulatory body, whatever it ends up being, what would they, <laughs> what would they do and what would they need to do on a daily basis to solve some of those challenges? My dream, my dream is we have somebody who absolutely loves and thrives on this industry. Somebody who will promote it, who will ensure it's recognised for the contribution it makes. Somebody who understands the challenges that we face on a day to day basis and then go into government and challenge them and challenge the civil servants on decisions that are made that simply don't work and cost huge amounts of money. That money could be spent quickly and easily within business. And basically, you'll see return on your investment within four weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, not 24 months. You know, it could it could be revolutionized. We need somebody who is going to not sit back and worry what their next appointment is when they're answering a question. We need them to be sat there saying, I'm not looking for my next step up the political ladder. I'm looking for the success of this industry. That's what we need. And somebody who will bring the industrial strategy to life, who will figurehead, be, a, be our leading light. And basically, we will be, we, we will be religious followers, you know, saying, yeah, we're right behind you. If you can deliver on this, we will be right behind you. Mm. And it will unite the industry. The one thing, people say to me, why do you keep doing this? Why, why haven't you given up yet? It takes so much time, you know. You've not really got anywhere. You've not got very far. And it's like in reality, no, we've not got very far. In reality, we've not really achieved any practical thing I can say to you. That was down to our campaign. What I can say is that as a result of all this, I'm now seeing so many posts, so many people, so many organisations talking about engineering and manufacturing. <clears throat> A lot more companies are shouting about what they do, thanks to our little hashtag, shout about UKMFG. 
so we're getting more messages out there about what we do and how good we are at it. And I love the fact that for the first time, probably in a long time, well, okay, other than COVID, COVID was very different. It did unite us all, particularly Ventilator Challenge and, and the fact that for once we were being seen for what we do. Um, but I love the fact this, I'm seeing so many people unite in this cause. Yes, we need government's recognition. We need someone who will speak on our behalf. We need someone who will basically, you know, join the industries together. We, there's no point in making a decision in terms of defence if they don't do something in the supply chain that supplies defence. It, it's all those things that that figurehead, that leading light, that that passionate person who puts this industry above their own position. That that's what we need. That's what that's what I'm after. That's my dream. Oh. A question from me, but at first, at first, just picking up on some of the com uh, the conversation you were saying there around, because I think the you ha there has been a lot done. Uh, the people that are saying there hasn't, you're not achieving anything, need to open their eyes because, as you yeah, say, there's a lot exactly. more, a lot more people, a lot more things uh, happening, a lot more posts, a lot more awareness, and it's and it's gaining momentum. The one observation I have is we need to ensure that that is aligned uh, and we're not splintered. So we're not seeing, because this is my observation is we've got these little things that are appearing and sometimes I wonder, hmm, is that really, you know, Andrea has created this campaign, has done this, and I may be completely wrong on this, and I start looking at thinking there's some self-serving intent from others on this piggybacking on the back of it. What we need to ensure is that we're aligned, all of us together aligned behind the campaign, your campaign, yeah. in delivering no, it. Because why would this why would the government back us if we aren't aligned with it? Yeah. Next the, the question I'm gonna ask you though was would you take the role? <laughs> um I have, I have, I have a lovely job here, and I have a great team here. Um, I would like to take some form of advisory role, but I do think this champion needs to be somebody full time. Um, we don't, we don't want a half-hearted thing. We need somebody who's hundred percent committed to this. And I do have a day job, but I would love the opportunity to be part of some sort of SME council, industrial council, you know, um, to be able to feed in because I'm not. I, I'm not afraid of being the disruptor in the room because I have no yeah. agenda. You know, I, I, I love my job. I do my job. I have a very happy home life. And I, I don't want to be a politician. I don't want to be, you know, I don't care who gets the credit for this. If we get our figurehead, if we get our champion for engineering and manufacturing, I don't care if they put it down to that campaign, that campaign or my campaign. I couldn't care less. All I want is to not be having the same conversations when I'm coming to retirement in 10 years' time. I want to have yeah. seen something change. And I think Labour are on board with that. I think they want to. But I do. I, I Funnily enough, I did get trolled a little while ago. Somebody who said, I'm really sort of not understanding what your agenda is here. And I, and, and I didn't reply because I was, to, as I was talking to you about another time, I've come off my phone at weekends because this was all consuming. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be honest, I was so exhausted and so tired doing full time job and this. Um, and and I actually went back and I was so devastated that somebody would even think that I have an agenda or I'm getting paid for this. <clears throat> I used I used I used the wrong term when I said to somebody about the idea for the website that me and Sam have been working on the manufacturing UK .org, uh, which will be this one central resource to stop people being misled about grants, et cetera, and to find case studies and to find stars of the sector. And I used the wrong word and said sold the idea to engineer it. You know, it, it it's never been about money. We, we, we had somebody who suggested to Sam and I we could commercialize the idea. And we were like, no, it's not what we want. We were offered sponsorship. No, because then the sponsor takes the lead on what content's gonna be there. The idea is that this is completely and utterly independent and a resource for the industry with nobody making any money out of it. You know, and it, it is very difficult because there are a number of people that, you know, see things and view things very differently within the industry or are looking for a particular, like I say, even the politicians to some extent will not fight for a certain thing if they feel it's going to jeopardise their next step, you know. Yeah, and, and they're saying similar things. But I think 
the two key messages we all have to stick to is a champion who will represent the industry and the industry is made up of 99% SMEs. That's what we have to remember. Yeah. And an industrial strategy that will basically not just serve this political term, but future generations. So something that will protect us because, you know, the biggest, the best quote I ever saw was the James Heapy thing at the MTA dinner when he said, you know, our sovereignty, um, our sovereignty depends on our ability to manufacture, you know, and it is, you know, it, 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 we are so damn critical that we've just got forgotten about for too many years and we need to change it. And my post tomorrow, um, I finally got managed to do the letter because I had to apologise last week because I had so many people off in a COVID case that I had to send out and uh, bank audit and blah, blah. You know, it was um, basically my post tomorrow says, because quite a few people comment on the post saying politicians don't care. So my, my, my closing statement tomorrow is if we don't show we care, we can't complain that they don't, you know, because at the end of the day, we've got to do it exactly what we're going to be talking about on friday so on friday we've got a connex members kind of mastermind session we've got a ex um council member from the southampton region ex former mp ran the ran the region ran the council for the for the southampton area and i had a chat with him yesterday um prior to the to the call on friday and he said exactly the same thing. The only way that we are going to get something in front of government to the right people that are going to listen is if we have one consistent voice, we're all pushing in the right direction, and it is the, a long-term vision, it's very much short-term thinking from lots of individuals. It's a consistent mass voice, and they will listen if we find the right people and the right groups and the right people to share it. It's just it's working out the best way to go about and doing that. Um, so hopefully we're going to come out of that session on Friday with some ideas and some um, action points for us all to take and all to go away and think about to actually start to move this from an SME. I am delaying my holiday departure for that session. Like Quick question, because uh, Thomas Flute's put, uh, put on, and um, he was saying who is going to decide the right person for the role so who who would you deem the people to recruit that person in i don't think we'll ever it's a difficult question that one but i don't think we'll ever be given a choice i, I i'm sure that keir starmer didn't sort of you know go 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 to people like us to ask if james timson was the right person for the prisons minister um i i guess I would hope that they would go to some of the trade associations, bodies, et cetera, to ask for, for, for nominations maybe, suggestions for people to look at. Um, I am hoping that if a, such a position is announced in the autumn statement, which I know is really like hopeful, <laughs> um, but if such a position is announced or somebody indicates that there will be a lead for the industrial strategy at the autumn statement, I would hope that they would be asking, like Jonathan Reynolds did, what can we do for business? I would be asking, it, I would hope that a similar call to action would be made. Um, and also, I think if it does happen, then I will be repeating my request on the LinkedIn post for who would you want? You know, who would you see? You know, me personally, Adam, I'd vote for you. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 uh, about that, <laughs> the, um, the other uh, the other side of that is because I've I've thought about this, and it's like you say you were saying there is that Keir Starmer, uh, Labour government, whoever it is, will will have a thought in their head of who this if they do it, if they, you know, and I hope they do that they put this position in, they put this person in, they'll have the idea who's going to go on it. Do you think then that board? needs to be recruited from within industry then that actually uh advise and yeah. maneuver and that person. Accountable. And, uh, yeah. accountable. and how do you how do you think we should do because the normal the normal rule of thumb that oh yeah if you make uk or somebody like that and I, and I think no absolutely not this needs to be a very very um a collective of different uh, 
industry sort of like federations or people and, and things like that and it's how how then do we formulate that going down the line but it was how how then do we no, but i think i think you're dead right i think the biggest mistake would be for this industrial council to be made up of all the people that have been feeding in all these years yes yeah you know yeah because again uh, you know trade associations as much as they uh, represent their members each one also has their own agenda you know yeah. and 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 that's absolutely fine. That's what they're there to do. They're there to represent their members to fulfill their own agenda. And the agenda for one trade association or membership association will be completely different to somebody else's. What I would hope they would do is go to those organizations and say, give me the top 10 people who would do this, who have had this. And then maybe that's it becomes a selection process <clears throat> because they're not gonna go out to general industry <clears throat> but Jonathan Reynolds did ask everybody to email him at the DBT. Um, what I will say is that I've noticed on my LinkedIn profile that quite a few from within that department have looked at my profile. I would hope they're reading some of the comments on the Thursday posts. So, you know, I do think there is a willingness and an openness for them to be speaking to different people. But again, we've got to ask for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. we've got to shout for it you know um but we need to get the position in the first place and we need to get the industrial council because as much as they're saying the strategy's got coming the, the council's coming we don't have a deadline for it yet you know we need some yeah. time scales being assigned to these commitments um mm -hmm. i know the government's had a lot to deal with this last couple of months um, and there's a whole host more to deal with but the longer and longer they leave the engineering and manufacturing priority down the line it the longer it'll take for us to get that productivity and that economic growth that they want yeah yeah the more uncertainty it'll drive without a shadow of doubt um the investment being put in uh, internally externally the lot um it'll, it'll have a it'll have a, a cause yeah. and effect factor but yeah ultimately by doing it gives that stability gives that security brings back the confidence which therefore grows the industry exactly yeah. Yeah. You you, rather so, than that rather than that self-defeating cycle you end up with the self-promotion cycle Absolutely, you know? win-win. Yeah. So, in terms, of, so you've you've mentioned a couple of things that to, to try and bring this around into essentially a consistent voice that we're all shouting on the same page, we're all talking about the same thing, we all essentially want what's best for the sector. You've mentioned that this strategy minister essentially has to implement some sort of long-lasting industrial strategy that goes beyond whichever government is in power essentially so that's one thing that we all need to be advocating for yeah. the other thing is obviously that it needs to be focused on the smes you know we, as you say we make up 99 percent of the sector so it needs to have a core focus on smes is there anything else that needs to be part of this consistent message consistent voice that you know if we see other people posting about it we can be commenting on there saying well are we are we on the same page around this? Do do you want this? Do you want this? Is there anything else that needs to be on that kind of? I think I think the key the key highlights the key pillars are the same for us all really. It's just what we're asking for as part of them, you know. So the key pillars: skills, investment. You know, we've got to bring in obviously, you know, green incentives, green initiatives, um, due to our sort of you know, environmental commitments. But again, I think the government are not helping on this front by having such a convoluted approach to it. We, you know, they could easily save a huge amount of time and money by giving us a one way to calculate carbon, one way to be able to report your carbon footprint, et cetera, um, a standardized process that we do, like we fill in our VAT return, you know, um, it, it would be so much easier and, and able to achieve it. I think you know, international trade, we have to make sure that we remove the barriers that we've seen since Brexit. Because again, it's, <clears throat> it's barriers to growth, <clears throat> and particularly from SMEs. You know, with the volume of SMEs, a very small percentage of growth in that amount of businesses equates to a huge amount of growth for the UK economy. Mm. You know, we don't right. have, it doesn't have to be something miraculous in within the SMEs to make a difference. It needs to be a small change in every SME and that will make a miraculous difference, you yeah. know. 
Um, so, you know, the, 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 the skills, the infrastructure, there's still too many areas, particularly the Midlands, suffer with poor, you know, even Wi-Fi connection, you know, cell phone connection around the M6. It's one of the industrial powerhouses. <laughs> you, you still can't make a phone call without losing your signal half a dozen times, you know. Um, so I think we're all on the same page in terms of the key pillars. It, it's it's how we're going to achieve real results within those pillars that, that we've got to be careful of. Mm, completely agree. Um, we'll start to wrap this up now. But what I will say is that if anyone wants to support, wants to shout about it, wants to promote what Andrew has been working on, then just have a look at her profile. Have a look at the thursday posts go back as long as you want and there's always ideas and inspiration and it will just essentially keep us all aligned and following that same consistent message because the more people that are following that message talking about the same thing the better chance we've got of actually getting this picked up listened to by the right people i would say and i think my my call is unfortunately not the right time to tell everybody to follow me because tomorrow's post is the last post for two weeks because i am going on holiday and I am switching the phone off and I am going to dedicate myself to my husband and the beach and the cocktails. Um, but there will be a letter, um, an email address in the post tomorrow because of the LinkedIn restrictions. I've basically done a word document letter to the MPs, which Adam helped me write. Thank you very much. I've combined a number of your letters together. Um, and basically um, I'm, my team here at Honal have said, just ask people to email us, we'll forward it on, because at least in Word, you can copy, paste, keep what you want, delete what you want, change your details, and then email it. That will also give us an indication as to how much desire there is and support for this. That then will potentially lead on to a petition or not. If we only get 20, 30, 40 people asking for the letter, there's really no point doing the petition. Mm. Because as I'm saying in the post tomorrow, if we don't show we care, we can't say the government doesn't care because they don't know. Yeah. So we have to let them know. Yeah. So you have two weeks while I'm away. <laughs> ask for the letter and get your letter sent in, please. Because if we get as many MPs as possible on board, raising the question in the house, we've got more of a chance of them actually thinking about it. And the reason I've pushed to do it now is prior to the autumn statement. If we can get in now and get those letters in before the end of before the end of September, they've got a couple of weeks to consider, oh, should we include this in the autumn statement announcement? Which they probably won't. But hey, as my old mum used to say, if you don't try, you'll never know. Exactly. Could not agree more. And that's quite a nice place to end it, isn't it? <laughs> um, Adam, did you have anything else to add or any final questions? No, we'll save that for Friday. Brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah, so obviously, thank you very much. Andrew, we'll, uh, we'll tag you in the link and go through some of the questions because there's been an awful lot of comments oh. and questions on this, which I did not have the chance to keep up with. So I will be going through those and going back to them individually this afternoon. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, if you want to know about, a bit more about what we're doing with Connex, then feel free to get in touch. Um, and yeah, that's all actually bring this consistent voice and see what we can do moving forward. And as Adam said, you've done a ridiculous amount already for the sector. And just looking back on the traction and the conversation and the amount of people that are picking up and talking about it goes to show that you are valued in what you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and, the, and, and, the one, and the ones that are questioning it, they need to look at themselves first because that says more about them than it does of you uh, uh, from my side. So for me, it would be a off uh, and interesting. <laughs> LinkedIn uh, won't let um, me do that, Adam. They'll yeah, not no, me. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. I do appreciate it. Adam round to them. Nice then. way to go on holiday after Friday. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, we'll yeah. Thank you very much.